As a family we join hands together Lifting praises to the Father above For sending His Son
Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. We are blessed to be alive and to be here once again worshiping God in the beauty of holiness. I have several announcements. Number one, Vacation Bible School experience is soon to come, July 19 to 23rd. Watch out for the information in our Facebook page. Number two, the Junior and Senior High School Bible Camp will be on April 30 to May 1. This time, public and home school, 11th and 12th grade students are included. The deadline of registration is April 7. Please contact Pastor Lim for more information. April 3 is Easter Sabbath. We will have a special program coordinated by Bayan Liwana, participant musicians and singers from our church and guests will encourage and inspire our worship experience, I believe, focused on the relevance of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So invite family and friends to worship with us, to worship with you next Sabbath. Number four on Thursday, April 1, Feeding San Diego Community Food Distribution at 10 a.m. to 12. And I'm calling our regular volunteers and anyone who wants to participate on this worthwhile activity. Please contact Pastor Lim or Miriam Alimagno to indicate your intention to volunteer. Number five, yes, work B on Sunday, March 28 at 7.30 in the morning. And we will clean our uh, kitchen and also uh, rooms around the kitchen. Number six, in-person communion service will be this afternoon as announced, 2.30. Please come and enjoy and experience once again receiving the emblems Jesus has given the disciples and all of us, reminding us of His love and sacrifice on the cross, the salvation that God has given us, and also reminding us of the soon return of Jesus. Our worship service today is coordinated by the uh, Reconnect Ministry. Thank you, Reconnect Ministry, for your involvement, reaching out to the rest of our young people and to our entire church family. May we be blessed as we worship the Lord together this morning. Thank you. Happy Sabbath, church family and happy sabbath to our extended family as well to those of you who may be joining us from somewhere else around the country or possibly even somewhere else around the world um, this sabbath is our reconnect sabbath meaning our very own reconnect ministry will be putting on the program and with that being said i want to urge everyone here right now to reconnect with one another uh, i know you know we don't really get to see each other all too often anymore, um, especially in person because of the pandemic. Um, so right now, I want to uh, take the opportunity to ask everyone to go ahead and leave a message. Um, I know everyone's kind of streaming this right now on Facebook. Um, so please leave a message down below, um, greeting maybe a, a friend of yours, um, who you haven't seen for a really long time um, at church, um, or maybe someone else, um, just, you know, send your greeting out there. and uh, Or if you want to send just a general greeting to everyone in the church or outside the church, anyone who may be watching this right now or who may not be watching this right now. Um, but uh, you can do that right now. You can also do it throughout the entire program as well. And to get into the spirit of reconnecting with one another, I want to share this Bible, um, a couple verses here from the Bible, um, from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 to 25. Uh, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Isn't that great? Um, you know, it's urging everyone, all of us, um, to not neglect to meet with one another, whether it be in person, um, or, uh, via digital means as this is, um, 
But uh, let's now um, prepare our hearts for worship. And um, yes, happy Sabbath to all of you.
Boys and girls, this is Atakea here, and I will be doing today's children's story. So today's children's story is called Joshua Takes Charge. Moses was dead. Joshua knew God has now chosen him to lead the Israelites. Before Joshua prepared his army, he had to prepare himself. God promised Joshua victory and prosperity in the promised land if the people would always obey God's word. The Israelites promised to follow Joshua and always obey God's word. Wisely, the new leader sent spies into Canaan to study the defenses of the great city of Jericho. Israel's first battle would be fought there. Somebody told the king of Jericho, there were spies in town, so he sent his soldiers to find them. The search began at Rahab's house, where the men were staying. The soldiers banged roughly on her door. Quickly, Rahab hid the men under some flax. When the soldiers left, Rahab used the scarlet cord to lower the men down safely outside the city wall. Why did she help the spies? because she knew God was with them. She wanted God to spare her life. The spies promised to save Rahab and her family. Before reaching Jericho, the Israelites had to cross the Jordan River into Canaan, the promised land, but there was no bridge. How would the people cross? God told Joshua, the priests should lead the soldiers and people carrying the ark which held the Ten Commandments. When the priest's feet touched the river's edge, God did a miracle. God made a dry path right through the water. After all the people had crossed safely, they placed 12 big stones in the riverbed and another 12 stones on Canaan's river bank. These were reminders to help the people teach their children about God's great power and love. Jericho had strong, thick walls, 
As Joshua planned his attack, God sent the captain of his army from heaven to remind Israel's new leader that God wins the battles for his people. God told Joshua how to attack Jericho. It was a very strange plan. God's people had to march around the city once a day for six days and seven times on the seventh day. Then they were to blow trumpets and shout and the city walls would fall down flat. Joshua and his army did just as God had commanded. Perhaps the people in Jericho laughed at them, but after the seventh march on the seventh day, the priest blew the ram's horn and just as God had promised, the great walls of Jericho crumbled. Only Rahab's house in the wall was safe. She had left the scarlet cord hanging from the window. Quickly, Joshua's men rescued Rahab and her family. Then Jericho was destroyed as God commanded. Solemnly, Joshua dedicated Jericho's gold silver, and treasures to God's service. Then he placed the curse upon anyone who would rebuild the wicked city. Soon, everybody in Canaan heard how Joshua defeated Jericho. They knew that God was with his people. And the end. This Bible story tells us about our wonderful God who made us and who wants us to know him. God knows we have done bad things, which he calls sin. The punishment for sin is death, but God loves us so much, he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross and be punished for our sins. Then Jesus came back to life and went home to heaven. If you believe in Jesus and ask him to forgive your sins, he will do it. He will come and live in you now, and you will live with him forever. If you want to turn from your sins, say this to God. Dear God, I believe that Jesus died for me and now lives again. Please come into my life and forgive my sins so that I can have a new life now and one day go to be with you forever. Help me to live for you as your child. Amen. So thank you boys and girls for listening to my children's story and I hope you have a wonderful Sabbath. Our offering today is for Southeastern California Conference Evangelism Initiatives. A group of Pathfinders took part in the annual Pine Car Derby event at their Family Life Center. When the pastor built his pine car, he used the wrong glue. He arrived at the event with a non-functioning car. The pit crew, as he called them, came to his rescue. They removed the wheels, used the proper glue, and put graphite on the wheels. But the problem is the car did not have any weights. No problem. Four quarters, two dimes, two nickels, and six pennies later, and the car met the five ounce regulation. The pastor named the car Money Changer. One less problem. The pastor was running out of super glue. The final coins only received a little dab of glue. He slapped the number 36 on one coin and the race began. To his surprise, he came in first place for the first two rounds. Then something happened. Two coins fell off of the car. The third round, he came in second. Another coin came off. He slid to third place on the final round. The little coins made a big difference. The pit crew glued the coins back on for the pastoral challenge. The coins made the money changer come in first for all the remaining rounds. When we give to conference advance, remember that all coins can make a difference. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Luke fourteen twenty eight. Let us pray. For all your love and care and the bounties you continually provide us, we thank you so much, Father in heaven. We are grateful for our online worship that unites us together to worship you and virtually fellowship with one another. 
And because of your unfailing grace and mercy, we bring before you our tithes and offerings. I pray that you bless these tokens as a humble gesture of our desire to follow your will and support the ministries in both our locality and in other places. Please help us honor you in everything we say and do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. At this moment, I would like to invite you all to please kneel in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend, you who sit enthroned over everything, we lift our hands and open our hearts to you. Thank you. Thank you, Father for this beautiful day, that we can still worship you, that we still have the opportunity to praise you on your holy day. Thank you for our families, friends, and the church, for all the blessings, the victories, and pain, the tears, and tests we experienced this past week. We just want to bring all the praises to you, Father, for you are worthy. Father of all mercies, have mercy on us. We are anxious, exhausted, angry, scared and sad. And we need your peace, God, to guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Be our refuge and strength. Be our very present help in this time of trouble. Even in this trouble, we thank you for your own Holy Spirit has always been present with us, always. And with this, we will trust you at all times for you remain faithful to us. Forgive us, Lord, for all our sins and please Assure us with your grace that our sins are nailed to the cross of Jesus, that we are clothed in the righteous white robes of Christ, and that you will never leave us nor forsake us, and that nothing, nothing can separate us from your love. Great Physician, we pray for those most vulnerable to this virus, for the elderly, the weak, and those with chronic conditions. There are so many people hurting and needy, and we lift them up to you, God. Please hear our prayer today. Bless us, heal us, help us, and empower us. Open the eyes of our hearts so we can see the opportunities to help and bless people. Help us share and show your love to them. All we have is yours and we surrender to you. We commit this prayer to you and only you. In Jesus' name, Amen.
Our speaker this morning is Jasper Ivan Ituriaga. Jasper longed to work for Christ after surviving a brain tumor while he was a teenager. After completing his degree in theology in the Philippines, he served as an evangelist and a pastor in Southeast Asia for several years. While working, God gave him the passion to use media work to advance the everlasting gospel. Responding to this call, he left pastoral work to pursue media evangelism. For almost four years, he has been in his radical journey of faith, traveling as a nomadic missionary, photographer, and cinematographer, traversing more than 45 countries, usually living out of his backpack and cameras. He's passionate in filming missions in remote and far-flung areas, particularly in taking captivating aerial and landscape shots. I believe God has a message for all of us through him this morning, so let's pray together that God is going to tune out the noise that naturally crowd our hearts and our minds. Today's scripture reading can be found in John 1, verse 14, and I will be reading from the New International Version. It says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. May the Lord bless the reading of this word. Hello everyone, um, happy Sabbath. Uh, I know that this is not my Sabbath yet. This is pre-recorded sermon. Um, I wanna thank the, uh, the guys who um, organized this for the opportunity, Sister Kim, for giving me a chance to share at your church. I wanna 
Uh, greet you guys. Happy Sabbath all the way from the Philippines. I'm 7,000 miles away, but we thank the Lord for this opportunity to be you know, in this space, you know, technology. I don't have to, to go all the way there to speak and I praise the Lord. And I, oh, I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm still dreaming for the time where we, all of our church members can be together. But, you know, it, it, unfortunately, we're not living in that time yet. But I want to I want to say that like, I'm really grateful for, for the, this opportunity that God has given. Also, a little disclaimer before I start, you will hear a lot of chickens in the background. That is my dad's chickens. I live in a in, in a provincial area in Negros, and so there's a lot of chickens around. I can't mute them. I can't cancel them. So uh, I apologize if you hear some of those. They're probably saying amen to what the preacher is saying, <laughs> but I pray that that this will be a blessing amidst all these um, chickens uh, um, uh, cocking. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I want to... I want to pray before we start, and um, let's ask the Holy Spirit's guidance as we start uh, the message. Father in heaven, thank you for giving us an opportunity, Lord, to study your word. Thank you for this chance and giving us an opportunity to have this gift of technology. We may far from each other, but you have bonded us closer through this technology and through your love. I pray, Father, that you please take away all the distractions in our hearts and minds, that our hearts will focus to you this Sabbath day. I pray, Father, that you please inspire us. I pray, Father, that most of all, this message will not just be a mere theological understanding of the truth, but it may be a life-changing message for each and every one of us, that after the Zoom meeting, this, this church meeting, Lord, we will never be the same. We would change into the image and glory of Jesus. That when people see us, they would see Jesus in us. And our life would testify that we have been with Jesus this Sabbath. Help us, Lord, to have an experience with you today. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Let me share a screen before I start. I, I prepared a slide for you guys this, this morning. And I hope that this will, be, this will help uh, give clarity to the message that I want to drive in. For you guys this Sabbath. All right, cool. The title of our topic this morning, I entitled it We the Church with a subtitle Church Redefined. In fact, this is the main title of it Church Redefined, Redefining Church. Now, let me ask you a question this morning. If you get to define your dream church, what would that be? How will your dream church look like? You know, you don't have to answer me, but for me, my dream church. I have a lot of picture of it. Growing up as a pastor, you know, I have a lot of picture of what my dream church would look like. I'm, in fact, I've asked so many people about this and many people would say, oh, I would love to have a, 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 a picture of a church in the middle of a wilderness, you know, maybe up in the mountains, you know, somewhere that is not so busy, out of, of traffic, you know, maybe good painting, a nice vibe. So, Maybe good music, you know, it, it, it really depends on who you ask uh, this question. But today, my sermon is really just an expression of how my dream church would look like. <laughs> so this is a little biased, and this probably just sprung out from the desire of, I want this kind of church. Now, I pastored a church for a number of years in Indonesia. I eventually left because I want to pursue my passion in photography and video. But I still do a lot of meetings. I still do a lot of pastoral ministry. But out of that experience I have in Indonesia, I've compiled an image and how it looks like, my dream church. <laughs> but before I start, let me begin with a statement from probably one of the most famous horror authors ever. This guy's name, I don't know if, you're, if you know this guy, Stephen King's. Now, if you love horror movies, <laughs> you've probably heard of this guy, you know, and 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 one time, uh, Stephen King was asked, what's the scariest word in the English language? Now, this guy is prolific. He's really good at writing um, horror films. And he was asked, what's the, the scariest word in the English tongue? And this is what he said, alone. Yes, that's the key word. The most awful word in the English tongue. Murder doesn't hold a candle to it. And hell is only a poor synonym. Now, this guy, now check this out. This guy it had made a living scaring all of us for 25 years, <laughs> for more than 25 years. And he was asked, 
what's the scariest word in the English tongue? He said, alone. That's the scary word in the English tongue. If you're single, this is kind of scary. Alone, <laughs> right? Forever alone. But, but notice this. He was asked, what's the scariest word in the English language? Alone. Alone is the scariest term. And I would agree on this. I think that we're living in a generation where we are so connected, right? That word, alone, so scary. We're so connected, hyper-connected, but simultaneously lonely. Do you guys believe that? We are the most connected people in the world's history. Like no, no part of history of mankind that is so connected as us. We are so connected. One tap and we'll be connected. One click and we'll be connected. We're so connected, hyper-connectivity, but simultaneously lonely. That's, that's how you describe our generation today. If you don't believe me, uh, suicide is on the rise. You look at the amount of depression, loneliness, uh, all these uh, things that is happening, it's on the rise. We're living in that generation. In fact, I saw news here from CNN uh, in Japan, and we know Japan is famous for people co committing suicide. We have a lot of numbers of this. But last year, right, in just one month, they have more deaths in one month in Japan than all from death in COVID in 2020. That's crazy. So they have more death from suicide, from depression, <laughs> from depression than all of 2020's COVID cases. That's crazy because we're living in that generation alone. That's the scariest term in the English language. But I want you to notice that in the Bible, there's actually a cure for this and it's a solution for this. In fact, I'll encourage you to open your Bibles to the book of John chapter one. John chapter one, if you don't have your Bible, I put this in the screen. John chapter one, beginning at verses one to four. John chapter one, beginning at verses one to four. Now, this is what the Bible says. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Now question, who is this word? We know this is Jesus, right? In the beginning, Jesus was the word. And Jesus, the word, was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made in him was life, and the life was the light of man. So notice the pattern here. We have a term called with. Um, there's, not nothing, there's, there's nothing like this in the English language, but we're making a word up for, for the sermon's sake withness or with thing. So God is always with God, right? Jesus, he was the word and he was with God. You see this concept throughout the Bible a lot. Withness, with God, withnessing, right? He's always with God. I'll give you an example. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? He also created man. And the Bible says that man fell into sin. Right, and by the way, you see the, the this the relationship between God and man is so intimately close. You see it throughout the Bible. In fact, the the only creature that was created by God without words is man. He did not say man and man was existed. No, he did not do that. Man was created when he he was molded and God breathed in him, right, the breath of life. Now. Uh, Sister Kim is in the medical field, right? When someone is in, if you if, if you see someone drowning or drowned, right? And he's, he has no pulse, not breathing. What do you do? Right? And the first thing you do, you, you, you CPR, right? And when you do CPR, what do you do? You breathe in that person's mouth. And when you breathe in that person's mouth, you don't just do it in a distance and blow, right? You put your mouth in that person's mouth. And this is what I believe. I believe that the mouth of Jesus was with Adam's mouth because he was breathing in him, the breath of life. That's how closely intimate God and Adam was. And, and, and check this out. The very first thing that Adam saw was not the elephants, was not the blue sky. It was not the green greeneries in the ocean. No, no, no. The very first thing that Adam saw was the face of God. That's how intimate God and man was. The very first thing that Adam saw was the face of God because God wants to be with man. But the problem is, man fell into sin. 
right? And I put some some of this. Uh, I'll talk about this later. But man fell into sin, and there's this idea, and you find the idea in the book of John, chapter one, fourteen. This is what the Bible said. Check this out. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So listen to that, right? The Word. Where was the Word at first again? He was with God, and the Word became flesh. So that means there is a relocation. First, his location was in heaven with the Father, but because man fell into sin, he came and became flesh and dwelt among us. So notice this, there's a shift. First, he was with his Father, and then because of sin, he went with us. There's a witness, dwelling. And this is where we get the word incarnation, carne, flesh from Latin, carne, flesh, incarnation. And so Jesus came and incarnated, right? He became flesh and dwelt among us. God relocated to where we are. See, religion is all about man finding God. It's all about what can I do in order for me to raise up to the standard of God, right? This is what I need to do. This is what I need to do. But the gospel is all about God finding man. That's what the gospel says. It's not, we're not required to go up and meet God, but God went and dwelt among us. Imagine if God says, you know what? In order for you to be saved, you need to be like me. Come up higher and, and be like me. No, no, no. It's impossible. We will, ne- we will never be saved. But I'm thankful for the good news of the gospel where Jesus said, I'm going to you. You see that concept? Within. I'm going to you. You're not going to me. I'm going to you. <laughs> you know, legalism says, Oh, you need to be a vegetarian in order for me to meet meet God, right? You need to go to church to do this, right? No, 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 no. You don't have to do anything. I'm just going to meet you there and meet you from there. We'll go together. That's what the Bible says, you know? But we have this concept, especially in Adventism. Oh, if you don't eat like this, dress like this, listen to music like this. It's all about what we can do for God. The gospel said, no, 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 no. No one can come up to this glory because all have fallen short. So I'm going to meet you where you are, not where you should be. That's what technically what the Bible says. And so we'll see this. He risked being contaminated with sin just to be with his people. He said, you know what? I'm going to risk it all. I'm going to go and be with my people. Someone says, history is filled with man who would be God. You have Stalin, you have Hitler, you have all these people who would be God. But only one God who wants to be a man. And I believe that. It's only Jesus. You know, you have all these people who wants to be God, but there's only one God who wants to be a man. And that is Jesus Christ for you, my friends. So it's all about God chasing after man, witness, <clears throat> within. You see that throughout the Bible, God and Adam, I explained this about uh, a while ago. You remember the sanctuary? You know, when God fell, in, when man fell into sin, what was the first idea that God made in order for, for, for him to save man? Exodus 25 verse 8, the Bible says, make me a sanctuary that I may dwell with them. It's all about within. You know, I want to be with you guys, right? Emmanuel, in the, in the book of Isaiah, his name will be Emmanuel. God with us. <laughs> you see this throughout the Bible. You have the concept of the bride. Oh, the bride, the groom will come and will be, I'll be marrying my bride, right? It's all about the, you see, the imagery in the Bible is all about relationships. I wanted to be with you. I wanted to fix that broken relationship. I hope you're seeing this, guys, because this is where we're going. Atonement in the state of oneness at one mint. That's what we call the day of atonement. Because God wants to be one with man. In fact, we have something called communion service. <laughs> Come into union. <laughs> Why are we having union? A uh, communion because God wants to be one with us. That's you see that throughout the Bible. In fact, the last illustration I'm going to give is in the New Jerusalem. Jesus saw. Or, or John saw, I saw the new heavens and the new earth, and there'll be no more sea. And then the Bible says, John says, and I saw the tabernacle of God was with man, and he shall be with them, and they shall be his people. It is God, and they shall be his people. They shall be his people. And it's all about building that broken relationship. 
That's what God's plan is all about. So this is my dream church. My dream church is an incarnational church, a church that is with people, a family, withing, withnessing, a, a, a concept of church where people are striving to be closer, to build that relationship with God and one another. And so the cure, Stephen King says, the scariest word in the English tongue, and many people, young people have struggled with this. The cure to that is fellowship. Fellowship, being one. By the way, the word fellowship is very interesting. It came from the Greek word koinonia, which actually means community, connection, fellowship, of course, participation. In other words, you're doing life together. This is what church is all about. Do you know in the Bible, over in, in the New Testament, or over 114 mentions of the word church, 114 times the word church was mentioned, and not even once it referred to building. I'll repeat that again, okay? 114 times the word church was mentioned in the Bible, not even once it talks about a building. It talks about fellowship, people being together. And so if your church is just a building without a connection, if you're not connected to your young people, to the people around it, old, young, wherever, if there is no connection and if it's just a program, it's not a church. Because a church is not a program, it's not a building, it's connection. And if there's no genuine, and I'm not talking about, oh, we talk on Sabbath school and we eat patla. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a genuine connection, a community with people, with Nassim. Same as Jesus, he came down and meet people where they are. And so this is a challenge for each and every one of us, my dear friends. And I'll present to you a problem. And this is the problem. And we are in a quandary. And this is the, the problem that I'm going to present this morning. The lack of authentic fellowship brings disinterest to our young people in the church today. I think the reason why we're losing a lot of young people is because not because we don't have drums at church, not because we sing old hymn. No, no, no. That's not the reason. Worship styles. And by the way, there's data to this that it's not about worship styles. It's not about conservatism or liberalism. It's not about that. It's, it does not matter. Data shows that it's all about authentic fellowship. If they don't see your church as a safe place to have authentic relationship, they will not stay. And I'll show you this data as we move forward. Max Dupree said, of those who are leaders who are listening, the first responsibility of a leader is to define reality. Your first work is to define reality. What is the reality in my church? The reality is we're losing a lot of community members, for, especially for my young people. And that's the reality I had to face when I came to the Philippines. I said, what is the reality? The reality is there's so many of my young people are not interested at church. Check this out. 60%, this is from Barna Groups, 60% of young adults who attended church in their teens will ultimately become spiritually disengaged at some point in their 20s. 60%. That means this is, in the, of course, in the U.S., but, but I see this a lot happening in the, in, 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 even in my own sphere. There's a lot of my young adult friends who are no longer going to church. <laughs> no longer, after 20 after they're no longer in this, the, the forceful nature of our Filipino mom and dad, where, oh, you have to go to church. After that, you know, I, I was forced to go to church when I was young. And as soon as I get older and they can't control me anymore, guess what I'll do? Because I don't see the church as a family that I can go to, I'll leave. And this is the reality. By the way, if you hate me, it's okay. I'm all the way from the Philippines anyway. So it's okay. But check this out. 36% of surveyed Adventist youth in the U.S. reported they did not feel like they belonged to church. 30% did not feel like they could be themselves at church. 47 indicated that their church was an exclusive club. And nearly 60% reported that while they used to be involved at church, they did not fit anymore. Now, Sister Kim, you're here looking I don't know if you can relate, but I could totally relate to the statistics. I think that we are in a quandary at church. 
30% feel like they don't belong at church. They don't, they can't be themselves at church. And they feel like the church is an exclusive club. That means if I don't eat like you, dress like you, do this like you, I'm not part of the family. And it's true. We need to address this. And I think we're losing a lot of young people because of this, my dear friends. Um, Barna Group also says around 1 million young people in the church are leaving every year. As a leader, that is concerning. Very, very, very scary. And I would present to you the idea that the problem is because, and there's a lot of solutions to this, of course. I only have one. I think because we are not having the concept of witness, within relationships, building relationships. A friend of mine once says, people almost always stay where they feel seen, heard, figured in, and loved. If they don't feel that concept at church, they will eventually not, if they don't feel seen, they don't feel heard and loved, they will not stay. You know why? Because doctrines and teachings will not hold people. Doctrinal disputes will not hold people. The doctrines will not hold people. No, 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 no. It's only by that building of relationship that people stays. And, and sadly, most of our churches today have focused so much in which day is the Sabbath day and which one is the right day to worship. It's all focused about debates and which one is the right day, which one is the true day. This will never hold people. Programs will not hold people. If it's not an authentic relationship, people will not stay at church. There needs to be an authentic, genuine relationship. It needs to be beyond four walls. Now, check this out. When our young people have struggles, what do they first think about? If you're young people, now I want you, if you're leaders listening to this, if you're a parent, I want you to just be honest with yourself. If your young people are struggling with pornography, with premarital sex, with, with whatever struggles that they have as teenagers and young adults, is the very first thing that they think about the church. Oh, I'm struggling with pornography. You know what? I'm going to go to church and talk about this. Do they, do they see your church as a place of refuge so they could freely ask for help and ask questions? Or they go somewhere else for help. That's one way to gauge. You want to gauge the health of your church? You ask yourself, if my young people are struggling with something, do they think about my church? The very first thing they think about, do they think about my church as the first place to go to? If not, there's something that needs to be done. And, and that's the reality of this, my dear friends. If young people or your young people don't see our church as a safe place to go to, there must be something there that needs to be considered. I hope I'm challenging you with this one, my dear friends, but you know, this is the reality. This is what's happening. I'm trying to be candid with you guys. I want to say this, information without relationship is intimidation. And many of us, church elders, young adult leaders, many of us pastors have intimidated a lot of people because we have not built a relationship. We have not built proper relationship. And we are called, my dear friends, to build that relation. I'll give you an example later on as we move forward. But check this out. Brene Brown says, if you ask me, the one thing I know for sure, after 200,000 pieces of data, and by the way, this woman is well-read, really good. But notice that she's not a Christian. But notice what she said. She said, I've studied almost 200,000 pieces of data. And she said, I know that in the absence of love and belonging, there's always suffering. That I know for sure. This is not a Christian woman. But she said, in the absence of love, fellowship, belongingness, and being a family, if, put that, if you put that in, in, in the context of church, if your church don't have belongingness, if you don't have proper loving relationship, there's always suffering. There's always suffering. And that's something that we, can, we need to think about, my dear friends, because doctrines and beliefs will not hold people. People are always drawn to where they feel seen and loved. For, sadly, our, our church has become a place of programs and doctrines 
but not a place for authentic relationship. Now, I can't judge San Diego Philam Church because I've never been there. But sadly, this is most of the churches that I've been to. We have focused so much on what we can teach to people, what we can correct and tell them instead of having a genuine relationship with our people. Let me give you a, an example of this in the book of Luke chapter 7. Look, book of Luke chapter 7. This is what the Bible says. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. <laughs> now notice this. Now, that, that, that for me is very powerful. And by the way, I'm almost done with this one. But check this out. Jesus, he came. Now, now, just for imagination, right? Just for the sake of the sermon. Imagine, you know, man fell into sin. Adam fell into sin. The floods came, you know, pe- the prophets have been killed by, by their own people. Men were drowning in sin. And I could imagine Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God is having a meeting. They're having a board meeting. And they're saying, what do we do? How do we reach out to these people? They're filled with sin now. How do we reach out to them? And I could imagine a suggestion from Jesus from that board meeting. And, the, and Jesus said, you know what? Let's eat with them. <laughs> that, does, like, that doesn't make sense. But Jesus said, you know what? Let's go eat with them, man. And thus Jesus came. And by the way, there are three, if you notice the, the, the word son of man in the book of Luke or in the New Testament, the three major vital points that was mentioned. Three times it was mentioned. This is very important for you to consider. The Bible says the son of man came to serve, not to be served. That's one instance. Number two, the son of man came to save that which was lost. The son of man came to save that which was lost. So two of those are about his mission. What is his mission all about? He came to serve, not to be served, and he came to save that which was lost. And the next instance you see is found in the book, Luke chapter 7. This is where it's found. And this is what the Bible says. The son of man came eating and drinking. In other words, his mission to serve, not to be served, his mission to save that which was lost. How is he going to do that? He's going to eat with people. There's a reason to this because, notice this, because information without relationships is intimidation. And so Jesus said, in order for me to to, to connect with these people, I need to build a relationship with them. I need to eat with them. And notice what the Bible says. And you say, here's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus ate with sinners. That's the way he reached out to people. He ate with them. And by the way, I put a note out here. Eating with someone in ancient culture means building a community with them. That's why the the Pharisees were so angry. Why is he building a church with his sinners? Right? Why is he welcoming people at his church? They're not, they're sinners. You know, and this is what church should look like, friends. You look at his technique when Jesus came. It's all about this. And I paraphrase it with these terms. Communion before conversion. Communion before conversion. He communed with people. Then he converts them. That's the process. And many of us, sadly, are going conversion first. Then we commune with them if they get converted. If not, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll think about it. Depends on how sinful this person is. But that's how our church works. But this is not how it works. By the way, if you don't believe me, I challenge you to, to look at Luke chapter 18, the story of Zacchaeus. Remember the story of Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was so short, he can't see Jesus. He was running. And so he climbed up a sycamore tree because he can't see Jesus. He was so short. And by the way, just a little side note, Zacchaeus cannot see Jesus not because he was short, but because everyone is too tall. Now, I want you to think about that. <laughs> is it possible that in the church, many of us, can't many young people or people that are babies and short of faith can't see Jesus <laughs> because maybe everyone is too tall around them? Maybe something to think about. But if you look at the story, Jesus came and he looked up to Zacchaeus and he says, Zacchaeus, come down for today. I will dine at your house. I will eat at your house. And fast forward, Zacchaeus and Jesus came eating together. And then Jesus said, salvation has come to this house. Communion, then conversion. Salvation comes because of communion. 
That's the process, friends, that Jesus did. And this is something that we need to do as a church. We have built more walls than bridges. And sadly, that's what's happening. A lot more walls than what made it bridges. And this is what a friend of mine said that I want to quote this morning. Remember, in the Bible, especially what Jesus did, salvation is in circles, not in pews. Most of Jesus' experience with people saving them was outside the church. It was not in the pews. It was in circles where he was eating with them. Most of those conversions came from there. And so I would encourage you today, my dear friends, Koinonia, this is something that we need to do as a church. And Ellen White says and added, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men mingled with people as one who desired their good. He showed sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Notice that. The last part was winning their confidence. The first part was he mingled with them. He desired their good. He showed sympathy. He ministered to their needs and won their confidence. And guess what? Check this out. Then he invited them. Follow me. Look at the process right before follow me. All these process of mingling with people, eating with them, desiring their good, helping them out. And then Jesus said, you know what? Come and follow me. It was then so easy for people to follow him because they saw Jesus as a safe place to go to. If our church invests in a relational church, an incarnational church, people from the outside We'll see beyond doctrines. We'll see beyond what we teach. And they see Jesus. They see our church as a safe place to go to. They will stay. They will stay, friends. And this is a proven fact. I'll show you some of the stories later on. But today, I want to encourage you, my dear friends. In fact, by the way, Ellen White says this also. If we would humble ourselves before God and be kind, be courteous, tenderhearted, and pitiful, there would be 100 conversions to the truth where now there's only one. That's powerful. <laughs> Notice that he did not say, if we only have more preachers, if we only have more pastors preaching the truth. No, 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 no. He, she said, if we had more kind people, courteous, loving people, if we have more of that in church, then we'll have 100 more people at church where we only have one conversion. That's crazy. You know why? This is why. And this is the answer. It's always about communion first before conversion. Relational before lifestyle. It's all about relationships first, friends. And I have to, I have, I had to admit, I, I need to learn this. I have to learn this kind of skill. <laughs> um, my background is an evangelist. I used to be an evangelist for Amazing Facts for four years. I traveled the world preaching around in different areas. So the concept of church for me is all about, I go to church and it's all about bringing people to church, inviting people to church. But I realized that's not what Jesus did. What Jesus did is all about bringing church to the people. That's what Jesus did. He always brings church to the people. So I have to unlearn these stuff that I've learned because man, all I do is just preaching, preaching, preaching. I've never built an authentic relationship with people. So during the pandemic, I went back home to the Philippines. And I have a, a number of young people um, here in this picture. I have more, but this is one in our outreach anyways. But, but I have a number of young people coming uh, in the Philippines. You know, we have drug addiction on the rise, drug use. We have uh, premarital marriages and also um, a lot of teenage pregnancies. And so I felt like, man, I don't know how to reach out to my young people, right? And so what I did is this. I decided to open our homes and my sister. We open our house every night for our young people to come. And so we would have game nights. We would eat together. Pandesal, of course, one of my favorite times when we eat pandesal. But all, almost every night they come here and then we eat together. Right, we we do we we laugh together, we celebrate wins, we mourn losses, we build relationships together every single day for almost six months, Just building relationships. We go out, we hang out, we live together. You know, they consider me as kuya, as a brother, as a place of refuge. Whenever they need help, 
just building that solid, authentic relationship. It's some of our pictures, I, I made, I wanted to make a safe place where young people could come, right? And so we would eat together. We do worship every night. That's my dad right there on the left side. We would sing together. We would do outreach together, go outside. And after a few months in the pandemic, we have 20 young people baptized. 20 young people baptized. No evangelism campaign. I never gave them any books <laughs> during this time. No, 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 no. I never gave a Bible study. <laughs> Not until they said, oh, we want a Bible study. We just had worship. We just sing together. We just ate. And they said, hey, we want to be part of the church because they see us as a place of refuge. And many of them were baptized. And now we eat together every night because salvation is in circles, not in pews. And these young people now are leading the church. They're doing the Sabbath school. They're doing preaching. They're leading the church now because that's what God has called us to do. We're called to do ministry beyond four walls. We're called to live life, to be with people. Jesus relocated himself from where he is to where people is at. Question I want to ask you guys today. Are you willing to relocate yourself? Maybe step out of the comfort zone. Maybe spend a little more time to eat with people, to sit down with them and listen to them to make them feel that they are heard, they're listened to, and to create an atmosphere of church where people are welcomed, where people are welcome. I have to check my time. I have to end. But today, I just want to encourage you guys. John 20, 21. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also sent you. Question. How did the Father send Jesus? This is the answer. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's how Jesus sent, was sent. He was incarnational, in flesh. Be with people, dwells with people. And God has called you today not just to preach in the pulpit, not just to give books, not just to do all this ministry stuff. No, 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 no. You're called to build a relationship, an authentic relationship with people. So I would encourage you today as I close, if you live in a bubble of Adventism, <laughs> maybe it's time to step out just like Jesus did. He was not exclusive. He was reaching sinners outside. And so today, maybe you're living in a bubble. Maybe you're living in a life where, where technically you're just living life with other church members. <laughs> I want to challenge you today. This, by the way, I want to give you a little secret. This is what I'm actually building a church plant in Bacolod. And currently, um, I decided not to be hired by the conference. I decided, you know what? I'm just going to spend my own money. And I want to build another culture where young people could come. And I have a, a uh, what's that called? A core team. And I encourage them. Hey, guys, every week I check on you. And this is the challenge. I want to challenge you to eat with a non-SDA this week, just one person, to eat with one, at least one person per week, to sit down, to listen, not to give a Bible study, just to sit down, to eat with them, just to make, feel, make them feel seen and loved. And I would encourage you the same way, uh, San Diego Philam Church. Uh, I want to challenge you to, to maybe find someone uh, this week to eat with them, to make them feel like they're loved just like Jesus did. Jesus ate with people. So I would encourage you to eat with someone this week and to create this culture of a church where we actually go out there and reach out with people through our lives, through the examples that we give. I hope that this message will challenge you and bless you. And I hope and pray that, that this will be a source of encouragement that, that we are called to do this, to have a safer church for people to go to. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for giving us a chance, an opportunity to study your word. Thank you for your love and for your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us this chance to eat with people, to commune just like Jesus did. And so today I pray that you please bless this message. Challenge us, Father. Challenge us, Lord, to step outside.
to do what Jesus did to create a safer community, a safer place to witness with people and to reach out, Lord, through the examples and the life that we live. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for Sister Kim for inviting me and for the chance, Lord, to speak the message of truth and love. Bless us this, this day. Help us to experience you this Sabbath in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful Sabbath service. Pastor Jasper, we thank you for giving us a reminder that Jesus came to serve and be with us, and that we should always follow his example in our everyday lives to bless and inspire those around us to be like him. To the participants, thank you for blessing us with your talents and gifts. They are God-given, and I pray they inspire us to share whatever talents and gifts we have to the world to show what God has done in our lives. Thank you as well to the audiovisual team for putting in the time and effort to bring us a beautiful virtual service. And if you haven't already done so, please follow our Facebook page and other social medias to get updates, see past services, and more. We're glad you joined today. So we hope you have a safe and blessed Sabbath day, and we hope to see you next week. Happy Sabbath!